coming to our third Southwest Fair Trade Business Awards, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, the chair of the Green Capital Partnership, Liz Zeidler, to open our proceedings. Thanks so much, Jenny, and it really is a, a, a real honour and privilege to be here um, to open this event. I was wondering whether I had a, a ribbon or something, but I'm metaphorically <laughs> delighted to be cutting it. Um, uh, on a very personal note, I'm, I'm particularly pleased to be here because it was way back in the in the sort of mid-90s, I think it was. I was trying to work it out earlier, but I couldn't quite work it out to the day. Um, when I was helping to run the North-South Forum with Roger, who's here, and, and Jenny and many others probably who are in the room. Um, and I think way back then, you know, fair trade and organic products were either available in, in very niche uh, shops locally or tiny little sections they had special sections those of you who are too young to remember this there were special sections in the supermarket that were very small where it said fair trade or organic and you had to really seek them out if you were interested in it and I remember in those conversations back then we, we sort of dreamt of a day when actually the whole supermarket was full of fair trade and organic and there was a little section that said exploitative trade or <laughs> chemically enhanced products um, now I have to say we haven't quite got there, but it is, it is surely a sign of the kind of fantastic work that people uh, like Jenny and others and, and many of you in the room have done, that actually fair trade and organic products are available right across supermarkets throughout the, throughout the city in shops, cafes um, and organisations. That, that, that is a big step. I know there's, there's, there's still far to go, but it's, it's exciting that we've made that progress in the last uh, 20 years. Um, this, this event is part of Bristol's European Green Capital Year, which is very, very exciting. And, and the European Green Capital Organisation is very delighted to be partnering um, with um, the Fair Trade um, Network to support this event. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we do so, because I think it's really important that we get that message out, not just to the people in this room who I know know it very well, but actually way beyond this room, that sustainability is a lot more than just, um, you know, uh, turning off our lights and, and putting some more um, insulation in our lofts. Um, sustainability absolutely is about the economic, environmental and social all coming together. And fair trade embodies, I think, all three of those in such an important way. Um, I often work in areas where people really are, are a long way off this agenda. And I'm, I'm quite often asked, what does sustainability mean? And I think it's quite good to remind ourselves that not everybody knows that. And the way I often explain it to groups is, is it ask yourself with any activity, would it be okay if I did this all the time? Would it be okay if everybody did this? Is it sustainable? Can we keep doing this? And obviously exploitation and using the land or the people in any country in the world continually wrongly is not sustainable on anybody's, uh, on anybody's agenda. So it's really important that we keep remembering that throughout our European Green Capital Year. Um, my role is I'm chair of the Bristol Green Capital Partnership, which has been going um, since about 2007. We're confidently now saying that we think it's the world's biggest city-scale cross-sectoral green partnership. We have nearly 800 organisations ranging from huge corporations through to tiny community groups and absolutely everything in between, who've all come together over the last eight years or so to say we, we believe this city can become an exemplar, we want to work together to make that happen. It's a very exciting element of what Bristol is offering um, to the, the region and to the world. Um, uh, we we are really, really proud to increasingly be working with the Fair Trade Network and, and we're, we're having some very interesting conversations with Jenny about how we can do that more in the future, so please do watch this space. Um, for, for all of those businesses that are in the room or other business that, businesses that you know about, not only can you, you support this movement by, by doing the sorts of things you're doing at the moment with, with your fair trade activity, but you can also join the partnership if you want to get more involved in, in, in that whole movement across the city, become more involved in changing the community that your businesses are based in. And, and there's also the Go Green project, which you might well have seen um, some, some details of outside, which is a, a collaboration between um, 2015 and, and Green Partnership and Business West and Low Carbon Southwest, which is offering businesses a really good, clear, stepped process to be able to, to um, green their businesses in that very, very broad sustainability way that I talked about earlier, that, that um, environmental, economic and social change that we all want to see. So, so do please um, come and speak to me afterwards or go and talk to the guys at the Go Green um, desk about other ways to get involved in this movement in the city. 
So not only am I very, very delighted to be able to, to welcome you to this event, but also I'm delighted to welcome our VIP guests that we have um, sitting in the front here. We have Sophie Tranchell, who's the Managing Director of Divine Chocolate, who will be speaking to you in a little while, and Laura Danielle from Ardman Animations. It's very exciting to be um, collaborating more uh, in the 2015 year with, um, with Ardman and with, of course, Sean, everybody's favourite sheep. Um, very, very fairly traded sheep. The wool on that, that sheep is... is, is top, top quality. Um, uh, I'd also like to welcome, welcome Angela, here in the front here, who is the treasurer of the Jesus Rivera, I'm not going to pronounce this right, cooperative in Junotega province in Nicaragua. She's a producer of fair trade coffee and cocoa, and she's in Bristol for the fair trade um, fortnight, courtesy of the Bristol link with Nicaragua, which is an incredibly um, active and, and, and important link that we have. And, um, and it's my honour to welcome her to the stage and invite her to tell us a little bit more about her work. Thank you, thank you. Buenos días, mi nombre es Ángela del Socorro Celaya Jarquí. Good morning, my name is Ángela del Socorro Celaya Jarquí. Vengo del departamento de Jinotega, municipio del Cuá. I come from the department of Jinotega, the township of El Cuá. Ellas son mis hijas, Yokaira, 11 años, y Ariana, 1 año. These are my daughters, Yokaira, who is 11 years old, and Ariana is 1. Y esta es mi casa. This is my house. Y parte del patio de mi casa con gallinas, banano, café. And part of the garden next to my house with uh, our chickens and banana trees and coffee plants. Y esas son plantaciones de café. Hace dos años los entró una enfermedad que se llama la roya. This is a plantation of coffee. Um, two years ago, a disease uh, got into the coffee plants, a disease called rust, coffee rust. Este café ha tenido que ser arrancado y quemado. Those plants had to be pulled up and burned. Muchos productores han quedado sin café. A lot of uh, producers were left without any coffee. Y aquí tenemos nuevas plantaciones de café con ayuda de comercio justo. Uh, this is a nursery of new coffee plants uh, paid for with the help of fair trade. Uh, tenemos que esperar tres años para obtener nueva cosecha. We need to wait three years to be able to get uh, to harvest from those plants. Y tenemos mi plantación de cacao. Here we have my cocoa plantation. Hemos venido diversificando nuestras fincas. We've um, been diversifying our farms. Y tenemos La primera foto ahí es el centro de acopio de café y cacao de mi cooperativa con ayuda de Comercio Justo. The first photo is the collection center for coffee and cocoa in my, um, in my cooperative, which was built with help from Fairtrade. Y estos son los tipos de chocolate que estamos produciendo artesanal. And these are some of the types of chocolate that we're producing. It's handmade. Los jóvenes que trabajan son hijos de los productores. The young people who work making the coffee, making the chocolate, are the sons and daughters of the producers. Y tenemos los precios del cacao en comercio justo. These are the prices of cocoa uh, through fair trade. Y estas son plantaciones de, que hemos venido poniendo entre medio del café para evitar los deslaves de nuestras tierras. These are plants that we've started putting in between the coffee plants to avoid the soil being washed away. Y ahí podemos observar los caminos de nuestra comunidad cuando están las temporadas de café con mucha agua. Here you can see one of the roads around the community, in our communities when the weather's bad during the coffee uh, harvest season, the roads um, deteriorate significantly. Y tenemos escuelas de las comunidades con muy malas condiciones, pero con ayuda de comercio justo hemos venido mejorando. Here you can see one of the local schools. Um, they're not always uh, in the best uh, 
conditions are not always the best, but with the health of, with the help of fair trade, we've also been able to uh, improve them over time. Y ahí tenemos con ayuda de comercio justo se promueve la salud y se atiende a más de 20.000 mujeres para prevenir el cáncer. With the help of fair trade, we're also able to attend to health issues. With the help of fair trade, we've treated 20,000 women in the prevention of cancer. Cuando vayan de compra, <laughs> cuando vayan de compra, compren con el logotipo de Comercio Justo que estarán ayudando a muchas mujeres como Angela. When you go shopping, uh, buy products with fair trade logo on them. You'll be helping a lot of women like Angela. much Angela and also to Nick for interpreting that was fantastic obviously people like me and also yourselves can talk about fair trade but when we actually hear directly from people that are being impacted um, and actually working with the effects of climate change um, as well as the fluctuating prices that you saw on that graph um, it's really wonderful to hear that the difference that everything you're doing for fair trade is really making on the ground um, just a little reminder that if you wanted to tweet, good reason to get your phones out, please do, um, live from the event today. Um, the hashtag we're using is SW Fair Trade Awards. So SW, obviously, Southwest, SW Fair Trade Awards, if you're able to tweet, that would be wonderful. Um, so please do that. Now, we're very happy to have with us today not one, but two guest presenters who have worked together on a fabulous fair trade collaboration to produce the iconic Shaun the Sheep Easter egg. So first of all, I'd like to welcome the Managing Director of Divine Chocolate, Sophie Tranchell. This is interesting. It's, it's in the middle on the screen and it's not up there, so somebody needs to help me technically. It should be switching. <laughs> so I'm um, bringing you... We're doing it all backwards. Oh no! <laughs> it's rude, the surprise! <laughs> so I'm um, also the chair of Fairtrade London, so I wanted to bring you uh, best wishes from uh, the largest fair trade city in the world. Um, it's, uh, it's really exciting to be here today. Um, we at Divine, uh, we love Bristol. Um, when, when we started in Divine, so I, I started in August 1999, and I was taking on the chocolate market in the UK. And I uh, luckily didn't know what I was taking on, otherwise I don't think I would have taken it on. And I sat there and I sort of thought, well, we've got no money and we're going to compete with some of the biggest companies in the world who are spending £6 million a year above the line to advertise their products. How am I going to make this work? And we came up with this idea of divine towns. And so we wanted to work out how we could talk to towns outside of London and make sure that we weren't doing something that was just the people around us. And so we came up with these divine towns by looking at what places we thought we would get a sympathetic response from, what places had already got some people who were supporting this sort of thing, what people, where, where there was good Oxfam groups and good uh, interest from the media. And uh, we picked five cities, and uh, Bristol was one of them. And so we came and we did a launch in each of the cities, and the launch that we did in Bristol was in 2000, and we did it in the Hotel Divan, which had only just opened, because Gordon Roddick was uh, a supporter of Divine and also a, a shareholder of Hotel Divan. And we had this fantastic reception with champagne cocktails and this enormous Divine cake that the chef had made, and we invited all sorts of people. We got people together who hadn't been together before, because we brought the people from the town council, we brought the people from Oxfam and Christian Aid, we brought the people from Waitrose and Summerfield, uh, and, and we brought our own people uh, to, to the event. And in a way, what was interesting was that was before fair trade towns existed. So that was so. So we did that as a way of, of recognising that we wanted to talk to people outside London, and we wanted to bring together all the people that we thought wanted to make the world a better place. And I think um, the fact that we're all here today proves that sort of was a good idea, and it worked. And divide and fair trade towns have sort of been what came next. And we're really pleased that there's now more than 600 of those in Britain and more than a 1,000 of them in the world. And most major capitals in, in Europe are now fair trade as well. So it's been really exciting. So I've come here today to tell you a, a little bit about Divine. And so um, the question we've been asking people is, um, why, would you be a, why would you be a cocoa farmer? So all, ar all around the world, we love chocolate. 
but um, there's lots of forecasts that saying there's not going to be enough cocoa in the world to satisfy our appetite for chocolate. And so the, the problem is that cocoa farming isn't, isn't uh, well enough remunerated for cocoa farmers to want to carry on cocoa farming. So those of you who've got children, when they come home and they say what they want to be, and you sort of go, oh, God, that's a bit, bit risky, isn't it? They're not going to have a good job there. It's not going to be a job, job for life. That's not going to be able to give them the lifestyle I'd like. I certainly think if your child came home and wanted to be a cocoa farmer, you'd be kind of a bit worried, really. So what we're saying to people is trying to make them think that thought, is think, what would it be like to be a cocoa farmer? So if we want cocoa farmers to carry on cocoa farming, if we want to carry on enjoying chocolate, then we need to make sure that cocoa farmers are paid enough to be able to invest in their farms, their families, and have a fairer share of the value that they're helping to create. So Divine Story is the amazing story of cocoa farmers who voted to set up their own chocolate company. That's Beatrice Ashanti. On, with her co cocoa table, so that's her growing the cocoa, that's her drying the cocoa beans in the sun. She has to do that for seven to ten days, and it's very important to move them and separate them so that they don't get stuck together. And the way that she does that makes a difference to how the cocoa beans taste and therefore what the chocolate tastes at the end. So the work she's doing there is, is important work for you to enjoy your chocolate. So Copper Cocoa started, their story is older than our story. They started back in 1993, and they're the cocoa cooperative that owns 45% of Divine. And so they started in 1993, and they're an interesting story because they're a positive story of liberalisation. And so that when uh, the World Bank and the IMF loan countries money, they make conditions, and the condition in Ghana was that you needed to privatise your key economic drivers, and cocoa farming was their biggest agricultural export and their biggest foreign income generator. And so they had to liberalise that, and that was an opportunity to set up a farmers' organisation run by farmers for farmers, and a charismatic farmer saw that opportunity. And so back in 1990, he set up the Farmers Cooperative with, with 2,000 members in 22 villages. And one of the first things they did was invest in buying weighing machines, and it meant that farmers could trust the transaction for the first time. And it meant that very quickly they developed a reputation for being honest and efficient, and sort of they then had this rush for membership. And so now they have 80,000 members organised in 1,257 villages across the cocoa growing belt in Ghana, organised in 58 districts and so this is a real there there is they're a significant player they're growing uh, 50,000 tons of cocoa that's more than one percent of the world's co uh, cocoa because yeah so that's that they're, they're they're a serious player in cocoa so they but they ha they're a democratic organization and uh, they have a fantastic AGM where two people come from each village so it's a really big a a AGM and they send two people to make sure that women get to have a say so one of the people ha has to be a woman and in their AGM in 1997, they voted to set up a chocolate company. And so in 1998, Divine Chocolate was incorporated. And um, our mission is to grow a successful global farmer-owned chocolate company using the amazing power of chocolate to delight and engage, and to bring people together to create dignified trading relations, thereby empowering producers and consumers. But we're, fair, but we're more than fair trade. So fair trade is a certification that talks about what, where the ingredients come from, what the working conditions are of the people who are working to grow it and how much they're paid. We're the only fair trade chocolate company that is actually significantly owned by cocoa farmers. Fair trade delivers reliable income and funds to invest in better living and working standards, but company ownership delivers so much more. It delivers profits, knowledge and power. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about all of those things. So the thing that's important about fair trade is that the farmers that we work with are organised and being organised helps you change your lives. And so I think that's actually to me, you know, 15 years on, I think that's the thing I've learned is that that's actually the biggest asset of fair trade. Because once you've come together and you've recognised yourself as an organisation, actually the world's your oyster. So the thing about the income that the farmers get is that they decide how to spend that money. And it was very lovely hearing about the, the decisions in Nicaragua and certainly the, the things that they've done were very impressive, the, what, what, what Angela had just said. But so the farmers in Ghana, one of the things they've invested in is water wells because access to clean water is a really big issue in Ghana because the other big industry is, is gold mining and that pollutes the water table. And so it can be really, really disastrous. I think one of the interesting things is, is the cultural impact of having a water well. Because if you don't have a water well, the women in the village have to go out and get water. So that takes them probably an hour each way, carrying the water, either in the morning or in the evening. And it particularly means that girls can't um, do their homework. 
because you actually only light for 12 hours a day. So if, you've, if, if you're having to spend the time when it's light going and getting water for your household, you probably can't do your homework and therefore you'll do less well in, in your education. I think the other thing that's quite entertaining about having a water well is that um, when, I, when I was at one of those wells, there were sort of lots of quite elderly men chuckling and I sort of thought, what, what, what am I doing here? And they were saying, well, the reason they like a water well is because it means that the savvy women stay in this village because who'd want to live in a village with no water well? Um, so... It, <laughs> Uh, they've also uh, built toilets, and that, that means they've got women's and men's toilets, and so the facilities are much better. They've supported, um, uh, they've built schools and passed them over to people who can run them properly, which is uh, very nice and has meant that particularly more girls get to go to schools in the villages. And then they've done quite a lot of interesting work on income generation schemes, so where they're working with women to build up their business skills so that they can sell other things than cocoa, so that they might sell um, palm oil products that they're making, they might sell bread, bread that they're making, or they also sort of cultivate things like snails and they grow them till they're about this big. So I must admit, I've managed to get out of the villages before they cooked me one of those. <laughs> and so that's been things that the farmers have decided to spend the fair trade premiums on. So then what Divine delivers is um, money. So that's us handing over our first cheque for profit. So Divine delivers money in lots of ways. We pay the guaranteed fair trade price. We pay the $200 a ton fair trade premium, which they decide how to spend. We then invest 2% of our turnover, which last year we turned over eight million pounds. And so we're investing 200,000 pounds in, if that's right, is that 2%? I'm hoping it is. Um, <laughs> in, in working with the farmers and recognising that if you're going to try and run a big business across such a big area in a place where there isn't access to running water, there isn't electricity, there isn't access to computers, how do you run a democratic organisation and a democratic business in that way when the literacy levels are as low as the illiteracy level is 65% among men in, in Ghana, in, in the cocoa growing area? So that sort of challenge of running a democratic organisation becomes very big. And so that producer support and development 2% that we invest has been invested in all sorts of things like um, supporting the election process, making sure that the elections are free and fair and that everybody gets to participate in the hustings and things, but also making sure that people understand cooperative principles and values through the whole organisation and that they can call everybody to account. So then another thing that company ownership delivers is knowledge. And so um, that's a nice picture of children in, in, in Bristol. So that's when cocoa farmers came and visited Bristol and that they were able to share their experience. And one of the things that the cocoa farmers uh, see when they come here is just how much chocolate we eat how much we love chocolate, but also how much we eat all the time. Uh, and, and sort of how it, it makes them feel much secure, more secure about their ability to sell the cocoa because we're not going to stop eating chocolate anytime soon. And so there's a sort of sense that there's, there's, a, there's a market there in the future. The, the other pictures I've got here is that the, the first one is that one of the schemes that we've supported in the last year is we did a pic, big piece of research which was looking at why there were, so of the 80,000 members, 35% of them are women, which is a quite impressive level of, of membership. Uh, but there is a lot lower level of women participating in the hierarchy and we wanted to see what was the barriers to that. And what we found was that the fact that they had a much higher level of illiteracy meant that they weren't managing to take up the more important posts. And so the level of illiteracy among women is 85%. And so what we've, what we've done is set up a pilot scheme of um, literacy lessons. And so it's literacy and numeracy. And they're having two hours, three times a week. So they're really intensive. And they're, we're working with the uh, government department of non-formal education. And so it's a really interesting scheme to try and get women to participate in the hierarchy. And then the, the picture on the end here is a woman who's participating in a model farm program. Uh, so she's Felicity Mensa. And what we're doing is looking, there's lots of work done where the industry, the co chocolate industry, wants to make sure that there will be cocoa in the future. And what they seem to have sort of missed in that is that remunerating farmers properly is probably the best way to secure that. And so they've done lots of work on planting new trees and trying to increase the yield of the land, but they're not looking at whether that actually increases the income for farmers. Because if you increase the yield by doing lots of work and having to pay people to work and having to pay for industrial inputs, then actually your total income might be less. So what we're doing is we're doing a program where we're comparing and contrasting organic farming agroecology and um, conventional farming to see which one actually delivers more income for farmers and it's we've just completed the first year of a three-year pilot program. 
Then the third thing that ownership of the company does is power. You obviously control it. They sit on the board of Divine, they have a say in how the company is run, and ultimately if they don't like what I am doing when I go and report to them at their AGM each year, they can sack me. So <laughs> it's a very different relationship. Um, that's a nice picture of the president with, pres with President Carter. Um, the, the, this is a picture of the women at the AGM. This is a picture of Mercy and Harriet who came over to uh, Britain last year and that's them at the BBC speaking for themselves. Um, and then that's Comfort Kumia um, speaking at their AGM. So the sense that you're actually empowered and you're running your own organisation. So we, the answer to the question, how will, co will cocoa farmers carry on cocoa farming, is that cocoa farmers will want to keep on co growing cocoa if they have a sustainable remuneration, if they have an opportunity to add value to the cocoa that, that they, that, that's in the chocolate, if they're given the skills to adapt and diversify and to improve the quality and yield of their cocoa, if they're part of a community all pulling together, sharing facilities, knowledge and accountability, if they're actually in control of their own businesses. Mm. What have I got? Something funny going on? So this is a picture of Comfort and Mary in Bristol. So that's, that's them from the, I think, from the bridge. So you're seeing a view over Bristol. And so Divine and Quapper Coco have had a lovely history um, with, with uh, Bristol. Um, we, uh, we, as I described at the beginning, it was our, well, it was our first fair trade town. Um, we're really excited that you're, the, you're having your, you're the European green capital. We're also excited that you've been a fair trade city for 10 years. And we, we, I certainly will be coming to the conference in the summer which, where you're hosting the international fair trade towns. So we're, 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 we're celebrating with you the success of Bristol as a place that's sort of leading Britain in, in showing how business can and should be done. And so together we can make cocoa farming worthwhile, we can empower a future generation of cocoa farmers and we can deliver a future where chocolate can be celebrated and cherished by everyone, which is the mission of Divine. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sophie. Do go and have a look at the Divine stall over lunch. You can buy your Shaun the Sheep Easter eggs and sample other wonderful flavours. And we'll also be showing the new film about Divine at the end of the ceremony. So if you want to avoid the rush for lunch, you can stay seated and um, hear the story directly from the cocoa farmers in Ghana. Just to say, those of you that aren't from Bristol, um, the South West is actually the leading fair trade region in terms of the number of fair trade towns. So it isn't all about Bristol this year, even though we're green capital. Um, and we are absolutely delighted that the whole region is represented here today because we are much stronger together. So the other half of our perfect presenting duo is Laura Daniel, Licensing Manager at the British Treasure that is Ardman Animations. Welcome, Laura. So, hi everybody. Um, so I'm here just to take you through sort of our thought processes of why we wanted to work with Divine on our Shaun the Sheep Easter product. But first off, I just want to say that really what Sophie has just said is exactly why we wanted to work with Divine. Um, they do, to have Sean to be associated with, you know, what they're doing and all the really amazing work that they're doing is fantastic and it kind of makes us feel like we may be contributing in some way to the good work that Divine's doing. So, um, so as Jenny said, I'm the licensing manager at Ardman. Um, and in my role, um, I seek out partners that we can work with to develop merchandise for our brands. A lot of these companies I do already know, and they specialise in licensing. Um, but I'm always on the lookout for new and different ways to commercially grow our Arden brands, such as Wallace and Gromit and Shaun the Sheep, which you might have heard about recently. Um, we do try to develop products that really do fit our brands. And as part of the Shaun the Sheep licensing programme, specifically around the movie that's just released, um, we wanted to look at Easter themes and spring themes. Um, as you can see, uh, it's <laughs> part of the, the brand is um, he lives down on a farm and it's, you know, very spring, spring lamb and spring and Easter do crop up a lot in all of the series that we release. We're up to our fourth series now on CBBC. Um, so knowing what a tough market that licensing confectionery was, um, made me realise that we need to come up with something rather special to be able to cut through the cookie cutter approach that people have to licensing. Um, this is when a brand is shoehorned into a specific product or shape. Um, they don't kind of develop the product with the brand in mind, they just 
put the brand onto the product. And we know that Sean doesn't work if you try and do that because we can't compete with the likes of the juggernauts like Disney and all of those really you know, massive brands that can just work and cut through that. Um, so you may have heard of a small brand called Frozen. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that I'm saying about, you know, we can't compete with the likes of Frozen. God, I don't think it's going to take off anyway. But. Um, so, which is when we decided to approach companies like Divine. Um, we wanted to work with a company that was known for its quality and also had its similar values to Aardman. Um, the world of farming essential, obviously, to Divine and also to Sean, um, but maybe in different sort of ways. Um, Sean loves nothing better than getting down to mischief on, um, in his farm, in his home on uh, Mossy Bomb Farm, um, much to the farmer's frustration. And also sustainability does feature quite a lot in each episode. Um, for example, Sean will find what, what's lying around on the farm, like old drain pipes and stuff like that, and make things to get up to mischief with, like playing football and that kind of stuff. So they, they recy recycle and re reuse things that they can find on the farm. Um, so partnering with Divine has enabled Sean to have presence in the confectionery marketplace while maintaining our brand values of quality and fairness. So each Sean episode usually ends up with Sean or the good guys winning out in the end. Um, we've also had a lot of fun along the way. Um, we have developed a really great, bright and engaging product. I don't know if you've seen the product out there on the Divine shelf, but um, those eyes really stand out and it's a really, really bright packaging. And We've worked really, really closely with Divine to develop something that fits in with what they wanted and also what Sean wanted. Um, and we've also added the Fab Sean headband as well, which gives a really great sort of humour to the product and a really good USP as well that's not really seen out there in the, in the Easter egg market. Um, so now, all we needed to do was to get someone to stock our product. Um, so picking our battles, we decided that Waitrose would be a good place to start. It's a British retailer, and Ardman's very, very British. Um, and they also go some way to support fair trade. Um, they stock a wide range of their own label and branded fair trade products, and who also ensure that they have a positive impact across the range of their supply chains. <coughs> Luckily, the combination of Divine's quality fair trade chocolate and the sense of humour partner with Sean brought to the product made the buyer say that it was a no-brainer for them to stock it. So I'm now going to have to do my blatant plug. Um, you can purchase your Divine Sean the Sheep Easter Egg at all large weight trade stores around the UK. <laughs> um, and to finish, I'd like to give you some light relief for the serious business of the awards and to show you the trailer to the Shaun the Sheep movie that is in cinemas now, my second blatant plug. So. <laughs> Shaun the Sheep and his flock know every trick. They're having a good time. Things can get out of control very quickly. Now, to get the family back together, they'll need a little willpower and a lot of teamwork. Stay out of trouble. They need to think fast. Look sharp. Walk this way. And always keep their cool. Because if they can't blend in. Thank <laughs> you.
creators of Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run present A Great Escape to the City. that really but we were in the cinema so we couldn't resist showing it to you thank you so much Laura and we must thank the Grand Appeal as well who lent us the Sean that was at the entrance of the watershed as you came in um, which obviously is just a little preview of the Sean in the City sculpture trail that's going to be in Bristol from the 6th of July so don't miss that so now we come to the award presentations what you've all been waiting for this year we had a 40% increase in applications from right across the southwest region from Cornwall to Gloucestershire to the New Forest, and a 100% increase in the number of businesses that reached the gold standard, which is a really incredible achievement, so well done to everybody in the room. Now the four judges, just so you know, are independent, so please don't blame me if any of the results are not as you wanted them to be. They marked the entries against four key criteria. The percentage of uh, fair trade goods used or sold, the management commitment to fair trade, the public information your business supplies about fair trade and what you've done to support fair trade activities in the community. Points are awarded on each of these criteria and totaled out of 80 to give us the level each business reached as well as the winners of each category. Now the judges were in their own words blown away by the quality of the entries this year meaning that some winners won a category by only one mark so it was a really really close sport competition. And we're delighted this year to have guest presenters for each category. So they will read out the bronze, silver and gold winners of each category and then the winner will be invited to come up on stage to receive their award. So it'll just be the winner of each category that's coming up this year. But don't worry, there'll be plenty of opportunities over lunch for you to receive your certificates and have your photograph taken with our guest presenters in front of our lovely Sean, um, what do you call them, standees, thank you. <laughs> so our first category the Best Fair Trade Accommodation or Conference Centre. And to present this award, please welcome the Managing Director of Sustainable Travel Company, Sordays, Toby Sorday. Well, what a privilege to be here amongst people who are doing such important work with such conviction and, uh, and a sense of humour too. Um, so the winner of the Silver Fair Trade Business Award is uh, Commonwealth Cottage. Uh, and there are three winners of the Gold Fair Trade Business Awards, which are at Bristol, Brook Lodge Farm, and Folly Farm. And now for the winner. So this holiday and conference centre has an unshakable commitment to fair trade. In fact, it seems as fair trade is woven into every corner of this place. Uh, if we take meal times as an example, having had a shower with fairly traded soap. Guests pull up in the restaurant on fairly traded furniture, buttering a slice of bread uh, served from a fairly traded basket uh, before eating a meal made from as much fairly traded product, uh, produce as possible under the light cast by candles mounted in fair trade candlesticks. Uh, if that weren't impressive enough, uh, their cookery book champions fair trade at every turn, uh, as does their website and every, uh, every public area in the building. But they don't stop there, for trading fairly is a mission for this organisation, to be brought to a wider world. So they host fair trade fashion events and train young international volunteers to go and be ambassadors for, for fair trade in their home countries. There can be no more worthy winner. The best fair trade accommodation or conference centre in the South West for 2015 is, for the second year running, Lee Abbey. Well, 
Well done, Liebe. And now to present the award for the best fair trade cafe or restaurant, please welcome the Chief Executive of Destination Bristol, John Hurst. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of things before I announce the awards. And uh, this time next week, funnily enough, I will be doing the opposite of you, Angelo. I'll be in another country with a translator speaking on my behalf. And I hope I do as well as you, because I'm speaking in Madrid to promote Bristol to an audience of uh, Spanish people, obviously. But uh, so uh, I have a, the interesting idea of working with a translator. So. Well done, that was really good and given me lots of good examples as to how to, uh, how to do it. And uh, Sophie, I, I can't carry on without saying something about you because I have a problem um, since I did a cycle ride. I don't know if you realise, but your uh, chocolate is often given out at the end of cycle rides. Can you stop that? Because um, <laughs> what happened to me, I did a 100 mile cycle ride and then the goodie bag was full of uh, divine chocolate. So. I just devoured it and uh, addicted to it now, really. Um, so how do you keep so slim, really? I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I should cycle more, I think, really. And, uh, and Laura, I was with your team up at, uh, with Peter Lord yesterday, up at, uh, with a delegation with, from Visit England, looking at the fantastic uh, setup you have there at Aztec West. It was just brilliant. And uh, I actually held a Sean in my hand, you know, which was uh, fantastic. So. Anyway, you didn't ask me to do all that, did you? <laughs> but you did say I could say a few things, uh, but I think it was probably meant about other situations. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I've been um, asked and I'm honoured to announce the best fair trade cafe or restaurant. And we have a, a few uh, here, so I'll just read them through. Um, the winners of the Silver Fair Trade Business Award, Just Ground. Oats Healthy Living Cafe, Redgrave Theatre, The Ark, The River House, The Swan, The View at North Bristol NHS Trust, and obviously The Watershed. Quite a long list. Uh, winners of the Gold Fair Trade Business Award. The gold is Eco Friendly Bites, Elio at, at Bristol, Full of Beans at Yui, Faz Cafe. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Unis University of Bristol Cafe and the Source Cafe. Many of those I've eaten in, but obviously I need to go and check out the others, really. So, And the winner, as well as supplying customers with an impressive range of fair trade food and drinks, staff wear fair, fair trade aprons and use fair, fair trade tea towels. I'm going to slip up on the, on the oh, lots of F's here. <laughs> they have, oh, we carry on. We've got a fair trade information throughout the cafe and online. We've, Huge displays in fair trade fortnight and extra fair trade cakes on sale. They also hold a fair trade advent calendar competition throughout December with a fair trade prize for customers each day. Staff are planning a fair trade menu for the International Fair Trade Towns Conference in July. I got there. Oh no, I haven't. There's the best fair trade cafe or restaurant in the Southwest is. Cafe Create. Thank you.
Thanks, John. And now we come to the award for the best fair trade office. And I'm delighted to welcome the managing director of Cheerdos Bank to present this, Charles Middleton. So can I just start by publicly thanking Divine Chocolate, because I get two Valentine cards a year, one from my wife, I think, um, <laughs> and one from Divine Chocolate. So it's a great, great privilege to get it. Thank you. Um, we, uh, through this, we're incredibly proud to be based here in Bristol in the UK, and we're also incredibly proud to work with Fairtrade really since we started, and, and with some of the, the early pioneers in Fairtrade. And it's, it's wonderful to see how the movement has grown and expanded into, into so many different aspects of our life, which brings me neatly on to today's award, which is for the best fair trade office. And uh, first of all, one winner of a silver award, which is Destination Bristol. <laughs> and then uh, several winners of a gold award, um, Burgess Salmon, Business West, Create Center, EM Highway Services Limited, Grant Thornton, Green Hat Design, and Minuteman Press. So, to the winner, um, as well as having an excellent fair trade procurement policy as part of their sustainable commitments, uh, this company has a fair trade fortnight employee engagement program and ensures that fair trade articles appear regularly in their staff newsletters. Their commitment to supporting fair trade is evident in their CSR policy and their support for fair trade is included in staff induction. They also held a fair trade day as part of their annual Green Week and supplied fair trade snacks to their Tour de UK cyclists. So, the best fair trade office in the South West 2015, and he happened to be sitting next door to me, uh, is Leon Stevenson. Thank you, Charles, and well done, Lyons Davidson. Now, for our fair trade retailer product uh, category, we've split it into two because it's very unfair for those who are just selling one type of thing, like just fair trade tea, for example, to compete against a big store that sells a whole range of fair trade products. So, first of all, we're coming to our award for the best fair trade retailer of a single product. And to present that, please welcome Robert Halton from one of our valued sponsors, Burgess Salmon. Uh, and thank you very much indeed. It, it, it's fantastic we've also got a gold award, which is uh, over the moon. That was good timing. Um, I think there's a bit of a northern uh, takeover here, isn't there? There's uh, two of us being up here from the north, and we've got Sean, who I will claim is a Lancastrian, um, <laughs> who's, who's moved to Bristol, of course. Um, the, uh, in this category, one of the things that struck me uh, most when I got it was there are some fantastic names for organisations uh, and the creativity that goes with it. And the winner uh, of the Silver Award is Diana Porter uh, for uh, Contemporary Jewellery. <laughs> and the, um, the winners of Gold Awards, and there's quite a, a big group here, which uh, again is fantastic. Uh, Cake, um, Christina Oswin Jewellery, uh, Erica Sharp Fine Jewellery, Fair and Square Chocolate Brownies. I like chocolate brownies. Um, I, I've got an admission to make. I had three of those before I came in here. Um, uh, fish Out of uh, Water Gallery. Uh, good as Gold uh, Jewellers. Well, I clearly wasn't good as gold having three of them. Anyway, and the Natural uh, Beverage Company. Um, and then we come to the winner. Uh, and the winner of this category uses all possible fair trade ingredients. 
uh, taking pains to source harder to find ingredients such as fair trade vanilla. All their labeling, uh, product leaflets, brochures, website of a fair trade uh, logo, and they promote fair trade on social media. They're an active member of their local uh, fair trade uh, town group in Devon and take part in many markets and events to promote fair trade. At this point, I wanted to open an envelope, so I'll pretend I've opened an envelope, because I've always wanted to open an envelope. Um, uh, and the best fair trade uh, retailer of a single product in the South West, 2015, is... Pause long enough. The Tiny Marmalade. Thank you very much, Robert. And now to present the award for the best fair trade retailer of multiple products, I'm very pleased that we have Chris Pay from Shared Interest Foundation who are sponsoring our lunch today. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Robert mentioned we're having a Northern Takeover today. We certainly are. I'm down from Newcastle. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we're, we're delighted to, uh, to be supporting these awards again this year. Um, so on to presenting uh, the, the award for the best fair trade retailer of multiple products. This is, I understand, one of the most uh, hotly contested uh, categories. Um, so you'll all be uh, listening carefully, I'm sure. So straight on to the winners of the silver awards, uh, and there's a few of them. Bristol Tourist Information Centre, Cross Street News, Oats Healthy Living Store, Old Brion 7 Community Shop Limited, Scoopway Health Foods Limited, Shaftesbury Tradecraft, and The Ark. Uh, and winners of Gold Awards, also a lot of these Christian Sustainable Supermarket, Fairs Fair, Green Life, Harvest Natural Foods, Here and Far, Karma, Lee Abbey Shop. Pool Grammar School, Pucker Herbs, The Real Food Store, University of Bristol Source at the Hub, UE Student Union Shop, Voyage Fair Trade, and Wild Oats Whole Foods. Uh, and so on to the winners. Uh, it was very hotly contested, and in fact there are joint winners uh, in this category this year. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So let me first of all introduce the first uh, of our joint winners uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first winner sells purely fair trade goods. Uh, they source from some of the most disadvantaged communities in India, transforming the local economy there, particularly the lives of women. They clearly communicate their fair trade ethos uh, to customers and other retailers that they provide goods to. They take part in local fair trade events uh, and use every opportunity to promote fair trade both locally and nationally. So the first of our best fair trade retailer of multiple products awards uh, goes to Kerala Crafts. to the second of our winners uh, this afternoon. So the second winner uh, sells an extraordinary range of fair trade foods, health products and gifts. The company and staff are fully committed to fair trade and hold community events and promotions to improve customer awareness all year round, but with a specific push uh, in fair trade fortnight. Potential suppliers to this company have to demonstrate their own commitment to fair trade before the goods can be sold in their store. 
They've been active in promoting the synergies between organic and fair trade and treating all farmers fairly, I guess those F's again, isn't it? Uh, through high profile social media and campaigns. So the second of our joint best fair trade retailer in multiple products in the Southwest 2015 is the Better Food Company. Thank you, Chris. We've worked too hard there with the two award winners. Now we come to the award for the best fair trade university or college. And to present this award, I'd like to welcome back on stage Liz Seidler, Chair of Green Capital Partnership. Thank you. Sorry, I feel like you've had enough of me already. But um, uh, yeah, it's great to see so many women, I must say. Uh, fantastic, both in the, in the speakers and in the uh, awardees. So, uh, so congratulations to all of those. Um, and the men, of course. That sounded really unfair, doesn't it? Um, I'm feeling a little bit left out of the Northern Club as well, but you know, you can't have it all. Um, uh, so yes, the, the best fair trade university of college or college was uh, apparently one of the closest of all of the categories. And in fact, all of the winners in this category are achieved a gold standard. So those gold standard um, universities or colleges are Bath Spa University, City College Plymouth, Falmouth and Exeter Plus, and University of West of England. Um, and the winner of this category, and I feel like it's possibly a bit of a stitch up because I'm a double graduate of this one, but um, I, I didn't actually know that when I agreed to do this. Um, uh, sells an impressive range of fair trade products in their shops and cafes and uses all available fair trade products in their halls of residence and event catering too. The university bars use fair trade wine as their house wine and there's also, it is also used at all student union socials. I think it's very appropriate. My memories of university was it's about learning and drinking mostly. So, um, so uh, hopefully they're learning about fair trade whilst they're quaffing their fair trade wine. Um, all catering staff receive annual training on fair trade and the manager is a fair trade ambassador. As well as a year-round fair trade events and promotions, the university holds special events for fair trade fortnight, including hosting a fair trade producer last year. The university hosts Bristol Fair Trade Network meetings and is helping plan the International Fair Trades Town Conference in Bristol this July. So the best fair trade university of col or college in the southwest in 2015 is the University of Bristol. Thank you, Liz. I promise it wasn't a fix. It was independently adjudicated. Now, the next award is new this year, but we're so grateful to the Southwest TUC who suggested it to us. This behind many of our winning companies is one or two key people who really drive the company's commitment to fair trade due to their own personal passion and activity. And so it's absolutely right that we reward them today. So to present the Best Fair Trade Advocate Award, sponsored by the Southwest TUC, it's brilliant week that we have the Regional Secretary, Nigel Costley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Yes, we're, we're here to celebrate uh, the development of change. We, we, we want to change people's lives around the world for the better. 
And yes, of course, we want and welcome leadership from the top, but we need people to champion that from within organisations as well, promoting, arguing, agitating for fair trade. So I'm delighted, to, on behalf of all the unions in the South West, uh, to present this new award for those advocates of fair trade. So, the Silver Award winners... Is it coming? Yeah. Oh, Kiel George at Plastic Butter Productions and Emmanuel Brownlee at the Schumacher Institute. Emily, sorry. The Gold Award winners, and there's quite a list. It's great to see so many nominees. Alex Hughes, Bristol City Council. Catherine Correa at Burgess Salmon. Catherine Davis, Destination Bristol. Mark Jones at the City College, Plymouth. Mark, Mike Todd at Cool Schools. Shelley Bartlett at Lyons Davidson. And Pixie Rowe at Lee Abbey. Congratulations. <laughs> The well-deserved winner is a fair trade ambassador who has done fair trade workshops in her own time in schools, at Bristol University, and many other events, often standing in for the fair trade coordinator. She attends all Bristol fair trade network meetings, often taking the minutes. The person who controls the meeting is often the person who writes the minutes. <laughs> She's on the steering group for the International Fair Trade Towns Conference, taking off time to attend. She's organising Make Sunday Special and Fair Festival in July to conclude with the International Conference. The winner has headed up Make Money Count team, planning events for Good Money Week and actively promotes fair trade through her own social media. Her a nominee says of her, we welcome this opportunity to nominate her for this award. We'd like to be able to show her how grateful we are for the time and effort she gives to fair trade. She not only does the stuff, but she's also the sort of person that radiates enthusiasm and positivity, and these are the great attributes to expand fair trade. So I'm delighted to say the best fair trade advocate in the South West 2015 is Elaine Ashley. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nigel. Well done, Elaine. And now at last, we come to the winner. And it's only fitting that we invite our two guest speakers to present the award for the best fair trade business in the South West 2015, sponsored by Burgess Salmon. Laura Daniel from Ardman and Sophie Tranchell from Divine. The winner is a clothing company which has fair trade at the heart of their business offering a range of school and workwear garments only made with fair trade cotton and ensuring fair trade standards at all stages of the supply chain. They travel the UK offering awareness raising presentations on fair trade and fair trade cotton to schools, colleges and fair trade campaign groups, as well as presentations to major UK corporates including JCB and Land Rover. This company visits schools with their inspiring factory manager when he's in the UK and bring the factory managers and workers into school assemblies and classrooms through Skype to bring these important issues to life for students. They are also working with Fairtrade India and Solent University students to develop an impactful series of educational and corporate marketing films concentrating on Fairtrade cotton. They are constantly seeking innovative ways to increase the amount of fair trade cotton used in the UK and do all they can to promote fair trade through social media and partnerships. So, uh, for the second year running, the best fair trade business in the South West is uh, Cool Schools.
Thank you very much, Laura and Sophie. And we'll be working them hard later because we will be um, presenting everyone else with their certificates through in the lunchroom later um, in front of the Shawns, and there will be um, lots of photo opportunities out there. So please do uh, come and get your certificate and have your photograph taken. We'd like to thank Aldman and Divine very much for supporting our awards, and you'll be delighted to know that on your way out, you're going to be presented with a Shaun the Sheep headband <laughs> and a bar of Divine Caramel chocolate, which is my personal favourite. Um, so please do make sure you take those. There are enough Sean headbands that if you have two children or two godchildren or whatever, you can have two, so please do ask. I would hate anybody to be horribly disappointed when you get home. Huge thanks as well to the Watershed uh, for hosting us today. Um, I've heard today that they've just added a fair trade wine to their wine list, which is absolutely wonderful. So that's something for them to put on their application for next year to boost them up. Um, and I hope that you have all gained inspiration from hearing what our winners have been doing. Um, it's just an amazing example, really, of how a business can be run for all the reasons that you are personally in business, but including fair trade as part of your ethos. So thank you very much. Remember that we will be showing Divine's short film from the Coca Farmers in Ghana straight after this, so please do stay and watch that if you can. And a huge thank you to all our sponsors, because we really, really couldn't run this awards ceremony without them. So the Southwest TUC, Burgess Salmon, Destination Bristol, and finally the Shared Interest Foundation who are sponsoring our lunch. And so to close our ceremony today, I'd like to invite Chris Pay to come and tell us of other ways that your businesses can offer vital support to fair trade farmers. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> To, um, say thank you very much for organising such a marvellous event. So this is oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. 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 Absolutely. Well done, Jenny. Thank you for all your hard work in organising today. We, we all very much appreciate it. And congratulations to all the winners, uh, especially to, uh, to, to Cool Schools. So great job again. Um, yeah, so thank you, Jenny, for the opportunity to just say a couple of words before lunch. Don't worry, I'm not going to uh, keep you long before you get to your food. Um, my name is Chris Pay. I'm Head of Foundation at Shared Interest uh, Foundation that some of you will know is a charity that um, provides business support to fair trade businesses, mainly in Africa. Um, but across some other developing countries as well. We're linked to Shared Interest Society, uh, which some of you will also know as a provider of finance to, to fair trade businesses uh, around the world. Um, and last year, for those of you who are here, you'll remember that I was talking just briefly about our project in Swaziland that's been helping uh, producers there. There's a few of them on the screen there. Um, and evaluation this year, I'm delighted to tell you, uh, found that 5,000 producers that we've supported through that project have had their incomes raised over the last three years by an average of 30%. Um, so I think that's really significant. Uh, and the other really great piece of news um, that I've got to bring you over the last year is that as a result of this project, uh, Shared Interest Foundation, uh, was highly commended by the Charity Awards in 2014. For those of you who don't know the Charity Awards, they're quite a big deal. They're a big national event uh, and all the big boys take part. Um, so for a little organisation like Shared Interest Foundation um, to, to be recognised in that way uh, was a very big deal. So, so that's been really um, exciting for us. Those of you who here last year will also remember that I was unashamedly cheeky um, in pointing out to you that uh, we were underrepresented in terms of our corporate sponsorship by businesses in the Southwest, and, and I threw down the gauntlet a little bit. Um, and I just wanted to say a big thank you, actually, because as a result of some conversations I had after that, I'm really glad to tell you that's no longer the case. Um, we are, in fact, overrepresented by businesses from the Southwest uh, who are supporting. So those of you in the room who have contributed to that, thank you. You know who you are. I've had conversations with some of you already this morning. Those of you who aren't, then obviously do feel free to come have conversations with me. We would be delighted uh, for your support. It really does make a huge difference. Uh, and one of the things that that support has helped us to do over this last year is to invest in our work uh, to provide financial management training uh, to co-ops across East and West Africa. Uh, we've done some great work this past year in that. Um, which, if you want to know more about, come and chat to me over lunch. But cutting a very long story short, we hoped we might be able to get a million pounds worth of finance out 
to small fair trade co-ops across Africa. Uh, and in fact, over the last two years, we've managed to get £2 million uh, of finance out. So it's been a great result, and we're very grateful. Um, but the next project that we wanted to do links to that was this summer to do some financial capacity training with eight fair trade cooperatives in Malawi, um, tea and sugar cooperatives. And we're hoping still to be able to do that, but many of you will have um, seen in the news uh, over recent weeks the devastating floods that have happened in Malawi, uh, and a number of fair trade producers have been affected by those. Uh, three of the eight co-ops that we were going to work with have been very significantly affected. Um, they're, they're, they have had crops washed away, homes have been destroyed, uh, and in one case there has actually been loss of life, um, uh, uh, which, which, is, which is obviously tragic. And we would like to try and support uh, those farmers uh, that have had their, their, their livelihoods uh, really damaged. There is a humanitarian response going on as we speak, uh, and it's not really uh, for us to get involved in that. That, that will happen by, by experts on the ground there. But where we do want to really help is to help those farmers to rebuild their livelihoods. So we're raising funds in conjunction with the Fair Trade Foundation at the moment uh, to help farmers in Malawi to replant some of their crops that have been washed away and to help them to get their businesses uh, back on their feet. And so uh, Jenny very kindly made the offer to me to, to, to make a direct appeal to you uh, this afternoon. Um, so as you're going out um, of the cinema, uh, you'll be handed uh, an envelope that looks something like that. Um, and if you feel that you're in a position to be able to donate towards that appeal, which will help uh, those Malawian farmers to replant some of their crops and get their businesses uh, back on their feet, then we'd be really grateful if uh, you would um, uh, take that away with you and respond to a free post envelope so you can post it back to us. If you, if you want to respond directly now, whilst you remember, um, then we have a bucket on the Shared Interest stall, which is out where, back where we're having lunch. Uh, and we've got some smaller envelopes, which will fit in the bucket there, uh, and some forms, which you can fill in if you want to gift aid that. Uh, and that would be very much appreciated. Um, but certainly if you, especially if you're from a corporate perhaps, and, and you might be able to make some more significant donation to that, but you perhaps need to go away and talk to colleagues, uh, then take, take the large envelope away with you, discuss that. Uh, with friends or just if you want to take that home and, and, and take the checkbooks uh, enough said you know what you need to do on that one but uh, thank you uh, for, 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 for the opportunity to do that uh, I appreciate it so thank you patrons uh, let me just finish by introducing uh, the lunch that you're going to get served um, and this year it has again been provided uh, by the surplus supper club uh, which is the catering arm of uh, fair share southwest who offer an ethical and affordable catering service um, these guys work with the food industry to make sure that food that would otherwise be going to waste doesn't. Um, don't worry, that doesn't mean that the food is uh, substandard. It's all well within its use-by date and is uh, very good food. Uh, but it does mean that using that model, they're able every month to deliver more than 70,000 meals um, across the region, across the southwest, um, which otherwise would be going to waste. So that, that has a significant impact, obviously, from an environmental perspective as well. So I think it's a, a great organisation that's providing the lunch for us. I hope you enjoy it, uh, and thank you for your time this afternoon. much. Please either stay and watch The Divine Film or make your way um, and have some lunch. So whichever you prefer to do immediately. Thank you so much for being here.